Good evening, everybody. Uh, just to show you the pull of this organization, uh, many of you may not know that Lindsay had a baby three weeks ago, her first baby. Yeah. This is the first time she left little TJ with a grandparent. So this is the first postpartum. And that's really a pull of the organization. And one thing I want to do before I start, I'd like to ask everybody to stand up and give Lindsay a standing ovation. For the my great pleasure just to close the evening and uh, those of you who know me I like to ask big questions so I wanted to start tonight with a big question what makes a life we're born we die what happens in the middle if any of you have ever been to Europe and looked at the gravestones you see a dash at the top and you see born and you see some words and you see died and you see a dash at the bottom. They call it between the dashes. What else do we want to say on our tombstone? You know, we know we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. So tonight I want to focus on a few things that can help us think about how we want to give our time, our talent, and our treasure in our lifetimes. How we want to maximize the impact that we can have between our personal dashes. And to help us think about this, I wanted to talk about three individual challenges that we all face. And then I wanted to talk about three collective opportunities that are on the horizon that I think will increase the impact that we can all have. So let me start by the three things we hear all the time. First of all, what do we hear? It's a bad time. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe yes, maybe no. Yes, it's tumultuous time. Nothing's stable. Things are not clear. Daily we hear it's bad for this, it's bad for that. But if we take the short view, we can always say, well, yeah, unemployment's high, the financial crisis is here. But if we take the long view, in the last hundred years, we've doubled lifespans. We've decreased the number of newborns that die at birth by three quarters. And we've increased worldwide per capita incomes ninefold. So yes, it's a roller coaster. Yes, there's peaks and valleys. But over the long haul, much can happen. Now may not seem like the best time for us, maybe personally or as a society, it could be hard. But I think a lot of us know that it's out of the fire of challenge that's born great opportunity. So I don't necessarily think it's a bad time. The other one we hear a lot is, my resources are too small. I'm not Bill Gates. I'm not Warren Buffett. So those two gentlemen, in their great generosity, have committed $60 billion of their own money to philanthropy. And in the last year, they've started a new initiative, which says, we want to get the 400 wealthiest individuals in the world to contribute at least half of their money to philanthropy. And if that's successful, that would be $600 billion. So we can sit there and say, well, why should we bother? They've got it covered. There's an interesting analogy that I, I tell people in the technology community. In the, in the 1890s, about 110 years ago, there was a director of the US Patent Office. And one day he went to testify before Congress and he said, you know, probably next year or the year after, I'm gonna come back to you and tell you to shut down the US Patent Office. And that's because by then, everything that was ever gonna be invented will have been invented. <laughs> I don't think so. And $600 billion sounds like a lot of money if you put it in a big pile. But we don't all give it away at once. We give it away over time. And if we look at historical giving trends of 5% or 10% a year, while it sounds like a lot of money, it's only $30 billion or more, which is really only a 10% increase on what we're giving as a country today. So that will not solve the problem. What we do see, though, when we take a deep look, and it was what Laura was just talking about, is when you take talented people, you get them engaged in social entrepreneurship, and you have them use the mix of giving that's appropriate for them at that moment of time and talent and treasure, amazing things happen in terms of social impact, and you've heard some of those things tonight. And the third one that we hear a lot is that I'm only one person. What could I do? 
And there's a lot of new research out in the field of human intelligence. And what it tells us is that human intelligence is collective. That means that we learn from all those things that we come in contact with. But it's also cumulative. That means that when we wake up in the morning, we don't have to invent fire so we can get warm. Okay, we don't have to invent the printing press so we can read the paper. And God forbid, we don't have to invent the internet so we can check our email. We don't have to do those things. It's cumulative. We, we float on a sea of human knowledge. So what does that mean to us? What that means is when you boil it all down and you look at how innovation happens, the rate of innovation, the rate of cultural change is directly determined to the amount that people interact, the amount that they work together. And that's part of the seed of this idea, this working together and leveraging human potential. If we look at it from another perspective, I'm a scientist by training, and so I've studied epidemics. I've also studied network theory. And when you look at adding one individual person to a disease cluster or one individual person to a social network, the effect of one person is usually not linear. It's usually highly synergistic, highly impactful. So each one of us is not a linear addition to the problem or the solution. We can have huge impacts on what we do. This, I think, is going to become more important because what have we seen over the last 50 years? We've gone from a very hierarchical, top-down society to a very networked, bottoms-up society where each of us have that opportunity to contribute in a much more free and flowing way. So I think the argument that I'm only one person probably doesn't hold a lot of water. But let me turn now to three collective challenges that we have by working together. And the first thing that we see is one of the big opportunities is collaboration. And the Monitor Institute, which is one of the leading consulting firms in the philanthropic space, just came out with their predictions for the next 10 years. What's the new big thing? And the new big thing as they see it is acting bigger and adapting better. So acting bigger. That's kind of what we saw tonight and how we face these challenges because the challenges are complex. There's a great word out there. People call these wicked problems. And I gotta say, I love that word, because that really gets your head around. They're wicked social problems we're trying to solve. They're not easy to solve. And as we've heard in some of the videos, you can't just do it in one country. They cross political borders. They cross geographic borders. They cross different sectors. So it needs to be a collaborative. You need multi-dimensional thinking from people all across the board. So we will see the need for more collaboration in philanthropy, and we will see the need for more collaboration across the sector. And the model of SV2 was for us as individuals, at the individual level, to pool our resources and to collaborate. What we've seen in the last year is us kind of taking the first steps, and the, the out-of-school time grant was really the first big step for us in saying at the organizational level, we need to collaborate with other like-minded organizations to really increase our impact. And what ended up happening through the Out of School Time grant is instead of funding one organization, we ended up funding nine. We ended up doing as a cohort. We ended up doing with a very definitive and focused purpose. And we also see this not only acting bigger, but adapting better. So the pace of change. We want to get smarter, and we need to get smarter faster. And it's not just about optimizing current solutions. I think that was great in Ashley's talk about sustainable conservation. It's not just the current solutions. It's getting in there and changing how people think, how we think about thinking. And I think one of the very interesting things on the horizon that's come up is the application of design thinking. And if some of you know what design thinking is, it's not thinking about design, it's designing how we think. Right? It's how to think about thinking. And we've seen great breakthroughs already in how that's applied to the nonprofit space and helping people think more creatively and really giving them a methodology and a process so that they have this confidence that they're going to be able to figure out a solution to something that seems intractable today. So that's a little bit on collaboration. The second big thing is investing. And today, a lot of us start out by giving to causes. And we start out, as we get more sophisticated, by giving to specific programs. Yet if you step back and say, are we going to solve these wicked problems? Is reading partners going to be able to help 100,000 kids learn to read if it does business the way it's done it in the past? And the answer to that is probably not. 
So one of the trends I think we're going to see over the next five years, and I think SB2 can play a role in that, is moving from funding clauses and funding programs to really investing in solving problems, taking a really long-term, holistic, structural view. It's almost like reverse engineering success. If you want to make sure every third grader can read at grade level, that's where you start, and you kind of reverse engineer what needs to happen to be able to get there. And I wanted to use one example to help you think about that. So those of you who were here last year, our keynote featured speaker was the New Teacher Center. And the New Teacher Center has a very simple model. It tries to make sure that new teachers can teach better, faster. And what it's done is not just worked on its program and make that better, but it's completely re-engineered its financial model and how it raises money and decreased the amount of dependence it has on philanthropy. And it's done the same thing in the human capital arena in terms of the quality of the people that it can attract from the for-profit sector. So it's like building a business in any sector. It's not just about the product or service or the program, but it's really about how do you build that as a tripod with the financial model and with the human capital model. One thing we didn't cover tonight, but I think all of us know intuitively who've been around for a while, is social businesses are pretty easy to start. You get an idea, you're passionate about it, you talk to your parents, you talk to your friends, you raise a little money, you work for free, you're in business. <laughs> but they're very difficult to grow. They don't have this thing called profits. So there's not the money to reinvest. So I think one of the challenges for us in the future is to get even more strategic and say, how do we help those best organizations grow? How do we put them almost on a pedestal, not just reading partners for what it does for third graders and learning how to read, but what it does as a model for how to build an organization from a program standpoint, a financial standpoint, and a human capital standpoint. I think that will be a big transition for us in terms of what's possible. And then the third big thing, I think, is leadership. So there was an interesting article in The Economist, many of you may have read it, an August 14th issue, it was about the social innovation sector. And what it really said is, we need a productivity miracle. And we do. The government's not gonna do it for us. There have been good incentives out there, like the Social Innovation Fund, there have been interesting programs around in the UK that are trying to transform how we provide these services. They're trying to enlist people like us in the process. So I think it's an incredibly important time because even the governments realize that it can't do what it needs to do. It started to look to the private sector for innovation. It's trying to create prizes and events and collaborations to be able to do that, and it's very early days. So I think the incentives are starting to be put in place. So I think that there's a lot of ingenuity over time that we can bring to the table. So we need social entrepreneurs. Those are the folks that start and run nonprofits, and many of you are here tonight, and we're so blessed that you're doing this work. But we also need you that are SV2 partners. And tonight I'm gonna to refer to you as civic entrepreneurs, because I think it's a very important distinction, okay? As a civic entrepreneur, you're putting in a mix of time, talent, and treasure. And you're trying to find and fund and help scale successful social innovations. We really need these transformative social innovations. And our, t our real our mix, our ability to invest our time and treasure and money over the span of our life will change. Life will happen. But I like to play tennis. I was really happy we funded EPAT, because now I can go play tennis. <laughs> but tennis, like golf and other sports, they call it a sport of a lifetime. And I think we need to start to think about what we do as a passion for a lifetime. We need to think about it that we will have a mix. And that mix of time and treasure and talent will change as we go through life passages. But the impact that we can have over the course of our lifetimes, if we know nothing today, is enormous. And I think that's the way that we would want to think about that. So it's really that ability. And our goal here at SV2 is really to provide a rich and sophisticated platform to allow people to get engaged and to find out what resonates with them. So if we can earn a living by what we get, and if we can make a life 
by what we give. I just want to close by asking you, how will you give your time, talent, and treasure between the dashes of your life? Thank you.